the long-awaited successor to the PlayStation, the Sony PlayStation 2 released in Japan on March 4, 2000. Along with it came 10 launch titles of various genres. 10. A reasonable number. Well, as the hype continued to build overseas in anticipation of the incredibly impressive new system, everyone wanted to get in on the action. When the PS2 finally launched in North America later that year, on October 26, 2000, the public was greeted with an insanely huge launch lineup of 29 games. Yes, you heard that right, 29. Many of these games were of the same genres and numerous publishers put out multiple games. It was oversaturated to say the least, but also very interesting. While for the most part these games are not the best examples of the greatness the system eventually came to achieve, it is an amazing encapsulation of something we will most likely never see again. 29 games at launch. Really? Well, let's take a look at all 29 of them and see what was going on when the PS2 came out. To make things easy, let's go in alphabetical order. To start things off, here's Dark Souls creators from Software's Armored Core 2. It's a decent mech simulator, where you're sent on missions around Mars with varying goals, though they more or less boil down to killing some enemies or blowing something up. It feels somewhat reminiscent of the Ace Combat series, with its mission layout, menus, and purchasable gear. The mech customization here is fairly deep but also extremely time consuming. After 4 missions, I could still barely afford any decent upgrade. Oh, and one extremely dated aspect, the movement is done with the d-pad and aiming is done with the shoulder buttons. Yep, that's right, and there is no option to switch it to the analog sticks. These controls are definitely a holdover from the previous console generation. It's not terrible, but it's dated for sure. The second game alphabetically is DOA2 Hardcore. It is one of the most graphically impressive games of the system's launch, and did a great job of showing how much more powerful the PS2 was compared to its predecessor. The stages are just so much more detailed and sprawling compared to any fighter on the PS1. You can knock your opponent off a ledge and jump down after them to a new area. It was really cool at the time. And now? It's still cool and very fun. There are a ton of modes, such as the addicting survival mode where, you guessed it, you have to see how many consecutive enemies you can beat without losing. Unlocking new character costumes is equally addicting. Unlike new entries in the series where this would probably be expensive DLC, here your new costumes are all unlocked purely through gameplay. It's enough to make you miss the old days. If I have a complaint, it's that the cutscenes, while really cool looking, don't really tell a coherent story. Still, DOA 2 was one of the best reasons to pick up a PS2 at launch, and it still holds up very well today. Dynasty Warriors 2 was the first PS2 game I ever played. It was at an EB Games demo kiosk and it made me want the system. And yeah, it might seem laughable now, especially considering how there's been, what, 300 entries in the series since this one? But imagine being a 9 year old kid and seeing this for the first time. The huge battles filled with numerous enemies on the screen at once was unlike anything on the PS1. I mean, the first entry in the series was a one on one fighter if that says anything. At the time, this was an amazing next step in the brawler genre and one of the most impressive PS2 launch games in terms of showing what the system was capable of. Now though, it's repetitive and 
Not something I'd want to play for more than an hour or two. But playing through a single mission is still fun enough to warrant a quick play. Next up is Konami's ESPN International Track and Field. This game feels a lot like it should be an Olympic tie-in game, especially considering it was released the same year as the Sydney Olympics. And wouldn't you know it, it actually was an officially licensed Olympics game in the Japanese release. I guess there was some kind of licensing issue. Anyway, most of the events consist of quickly pressing buttons to make someone run or swim or do other physical activities. I just couldn't get the hang of it. Here I am awkwardly running in slow motion as everyone else runs at full speed. It also has this weird robot voiced announcer. Republic of Trinidad and Tobago in lane 7. At least the trap shooting segment is kind of fun, but that's about it. The score was 315 points. And now, another Konami-made ESPN game. ESPN X Games Snowboarding is one of two snowboarding games that were available at the PS2's launch. This one is... the lesser of the two. When looking through the main menu, there are a bunch of snowboarding videos you can watch. That's cool, I guess. I do like how you can customize your character from their look to their gear. While most of the game is realistic looking, for some reason there's this lounge area where everything is cartoony. Here you can buy new gear or check your stats. It's very odd, but I actually kind of like it. The actual gameplay though? It could be better. And in fact it was done better on the exact same day. We'll get to that later. Eternal Ring is the second launch game developed by From Software. This game is somewhat of a spiritual sequel to their Kingsfield and Shadow Tower series, which are themselves the precursors to Dark slash Demon Souls. Anyway, this game is definitely a step up from Kingsfield and Shadow Tower. It's nowhere near as clunky, and hitting enemies is much less frustrating. Well, hitting flying enemies can still be a pain. The only thing that really bothered me was the lack of a map. It's really easy to get lost with no clue where to go next. Still, it has its charm. If you like first person dungeon crawlers, you may like this. Up next is Evergrace. Let's see, who made this? From Software, yep. Another From Software launch game, and this is the final one. It's an action RPG that plays a bit similarly to Secret of Mana. You can't just keep hitting away at your enemies, you have to wait for your stamina to recover to get in a strong hit. The setting and music is very strange, but I like it. It has such a bizarre feel to it, especially some of the weird looking characters. It's not at all what I was expecting. I'm actually kind of impressed by From Software. Three launch titles, and they all play and feel very different. And now, Fantavision. This was the one and only PS2 launch game that was published by Sony. At first glance, it definitely seems questionable that this is what they chose to go with. I mean, it's a puzzle game, which isn't a genre you'd think would be best suited to show off a new system. But graphically, it actually is very impressive due to its use of particle effects. Nothing like this could have been done on the PS1, at least not looking the way it does here. Anyway, the goal of the game is to set off fireworks, making as big of a combo as you can. It's very old fashioned in that regard. There's no quest mode or anything like that. You play as many levels as you can without losing, and if you do lose, you can try again from the beginning. The game is very fun. 
After getting a game over, you'll probably find yourself going right into a new round to see if you can get further and beat your previous score. This is a solid recommend. And luckily, this, along with the previous game, Eternal Ring, are both available digitally for PS4 and will even be playable on PS5. So, at least some of these games aren't completely lost to time. Gun Griffin Blaze is a game I was pleasantly surprised with. The game shares a lot of similarities with Armored Core 2, first and foremost being that it is a mech shooter based around accepting missions and upgrading your giant robot. But how it plays is quite different. For starters, it's in first person. It's also much faster paced, with you often flying around the mission area to get an advantage over your enemy. It has a somewhat arcadey feel, points and all. Oh, and you gotta love these destructible environments. The upgrading is also much more satisfying. Rather than paying for new gear, after each mission you unlock various items. This makes things much faster and more enjoyable. The mech layout menu is pretty cool too. I have two complaints. One is that as far as I could tell, the game lacks a map, making getting around and finding your remaining enemies tedious at times. Second, the analog sticks are reversed compared to modern FPS games, with no option of changing them. You use the right stick to move, and the left to aim. This was in a time when there was still no first person control standard, so it's far from the first game of the era to have this layout. I'll let it slide. I had a very good time overall. Mission complete. If you didn't know Japanese history, you will after playing Kessen. It is the second launch title published by Koei, the other being Dynasty Warriors 2. And while it may look visually similar, it couldn't be more different in gameplay and presentation. The game is a unique take on the real-time strategy genre, where you take part in large battles to unite Japan. In fact, these battles are based on real ones from history. The game's story plays out somewhat like a documentary, with a narrator explaining the historic events. Of course, a lot of the things that happen in between the narration are added for dramatic effect. Navigating the battles could have been done better, I was often confused about which unit I was selecting. Still, the battles do look pretty cool, even if the same animations get repeated over and over again. Ready. Fire! Madden NFL 2001 is a game I admittedly never thought I would play, but thanks to it being a PS2 launch game, here we are. I had some fun with the character customization. Couldn't figure out how to find them after making them though. I also love the soundtrack. I wish it was in something non-sports related. When it comes to the gameplay, I'm just lost. What the hell does this even mean? Well, I eventually did figure it out. It's not bad at all. If you were a football fan in the year 2000, this game would have been great. And now we get to our first racing game with Rockstar's Midnight Club Street Racing. The game does quite a lot to differentiate itself from the more traditional racers of the time. You race from checkpoint to checkpoint around New York or London. The races can be fairly short since there are no laps. Of course, that would be how an illegal street race would work, so it only makes sense. In some ways, it feels like a precursor to GTA 3. This is especially apparent in the free roaming mode, but there are other little things as well, such as the whole checkpoint system, which is how races work in the GTA games, or how you can get into police chases mid-race. Oh, 
and you can run over pedestrians. And now on to Namco's MotoGP. It's a motorcycle racing game with as big of an emphasis on slowing down as speeding up. You need to constantly check your speed to be able to make the game's sharp turns. Graphically speaking, this is another very impressive launch game. The way the road speeds by still looks good even today. This is one of the best racing games you could have gotten, if not the best. The second EA Sports game of the PS2's launch is NHL 2001. As with Madden, the game has a really awesome soundtrack. It also has a character customization mode, but it's much less comprehensive. You can't choose how they look, just their basic info and stats. I found the gameplay much more fun and easy to get into than Madden. I could even score a few points. Sullivan scores! Beauty! Assisted by McKinnon. If there's one major flaw, it's the camera. I often didn't know where my off-screen teammates were, and had to guess if I could pass to one or not. But there are at least a lot of camera options if you want to mess around to find which one works best. Camera issues aside, I had fun with this one and found myself getting fairly into the match I was in. Orphan, Scion of Sorcery, is another game I enjoyed much more than I was expecting. The game is an action RPG that was surprisingly published by Activision. It's complete with cheesy dubbed anime cutscenes and all. Actually, the dubbing isn't that bad. Funny enough, it's somewhat like a Metal Gear reunion. The voice of the main character is Raiden, but the best part is hearing Roy Campbell explain the new magic you unlock. The Shield of Immunity reflects poison attacks back to all enemies. As for the gameplay, it's kind of strange. Sometimes you're jumping around and slashing at enemies in real time, but a majority of the combat, including all of the bosses I encountered, is done in a completely different style where you're locked in place while shooting projectiles or blocking. It's not great, but I liked how cool some of these scenes were. The game is very flawed, still, I was having fun. I just might go back and play more of this one. Cue Ball Billiards Master. Okay, this has got to be the least impressive game of the lot. The main menu actually makes it look kinda cool. The music isn't too bad either. The game itself though? One thing that's extremely annoying is how the camera will briefly shift to any pocket a ball gets near, which is super disorienting. This is often a minigame included in a full retail game. If this was the one PS2 game you picked up on October 26, why did you even get the system? Eh, the DVD player, I suppose. A game more notable for those involved than its actual gameplay, Ready to Rumble Boxing Round 2 is not something you really need to go back to. Boxing announcer Michael Buffer, who originated the phrase the game gets its namesake from, appears as himself and does introductions for all of the game's cartoony cast of characters. The Funkadelic Boogie Bro! Speaking of the characters, that's the best thing about the game. It includes the likes of Shaq, Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, and Michael Jackson. Yeah. If you usually don't do well at boxing games, well, this game will be no different. I guess seeing Michael Jackson get beat up is at least something.
and now Namco's other launch racer, Ridge Racer 5. The original Ridge Racer was the best PS1 launch game, so it's only fitting Namco put out the fifth entry in the series as a PS2 launch title. It has everything you would have come to expect from the Ridge Racer series at the time, and more. It's fast, fun, addicting, and has a great soundtrack. Winning feels as great as ever. This was one of the earliest PS2 games shown off to demonstrate the increased power of the new system, and yeah, it's kind of amazing to see it side by side with the original. I'd say this game just slightly outdoes Namco's other racer, MotoGP, but you couldn't have gone wrong either way. Silent Scope. Remember Silent Scope? That extremely bloody and awesome arcade sniping simulator? Well, this is the PS2 version, except there's no blood. Oh, and no giant gun controller, so kind of disappointing in comparison. On its own, it's fine. I know I played the demo to this a ton when I was a kid. It feels kind of like a slower version of Time Crisis. There's an arcade mode, which is more or less the same as the original, sands, blood, and gun controller, and a few challenge modes you can play as well. Overall, it's okay. And here's another game published by Rockstar, Smuggler's Run. Actually, it's kind of amazing to imagine a time when they would put out two games on a single day considering they now go years between new releases. Anyway, Smuggler's Run and Midnight Club are somewhat like two sides of the same coin. Smuggler's Run has a lot of similar gameplay, such as driving from checkpoint to checkpoint in races. However, the country setting gives it a much different vibe. The main goal of the game is picking up drugs, or er, contraband, and delivering them to various locations. Police chases are here and play a much bigger role than they do in Midnight Club. Oh, and as in Midnight Club, go ahead and run over pedestrians. Animals too this time. Overall, I found this to be the better of the two. And here's that other snowboarding game I was talking about, SSX. The game is widely considered to be the best PS2 launch game. I don't know if I'd call it that, but it is a lot of fun. It's a game that's all about style. You race down scenic mountains against your opponents while at the same time trying to pull off as many tricks as you can. And man, landing tricks feels so good. Oh, I love the soundtrack too. It's an all-around, very polished game. It was a really different take on the snowboarding genre, but it paid off. A lot of people really love this game. Street Fighter EX3 is the third and seemingly final entry in Capcom's bizarre Street Fighter EX spin-off series. Although I always assumed it was simply a 3D version of the Street Fighter series, it's not quite that. Each round has a different playstyle. Sometimes it's one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes it's one-on-three, sometimes it's tag team. After each round, you can recruit one of the fighters you beat to join your team. It's quite different from a normal Street Fighter entry to say the least. And it's also yet another game that forces you to use the D-pad for movement. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time pulling off special moves without an analog stick. It's definitely the weakest of the fighters the PS2 launched with. Summoner, 
was game developer Volition's attempt at taking the PC RPG experience and putting it on consoles. And they succeeded in their goal. It definitely has that feel, for better or worse. There are some pretty bad camera issues here. Like, in this big town, I'm forced to use a top-down perspective to get around. Speaking of the big town, everything is big, and that's not necessarily a good thing here. Getting around is a chore and dungeons take forever to get through, and it doesn't help that enemies take a lot of hits to take down. This game is a major time investment. Still, once you get your summoning ability and your party increases in size, the game starts to get a little better, but not by much. At first glance, Swing Away Golf looks like nothing more than a ripoff of Hot Shots Golf. And it basically is, but when it comes to ripoffs, there are good ones and there are bad ones. This is a good one. The game was published by EA under their Electronic Arts distribution label. This is the first and only time I've ever seen this. Anyway, on to the game. Admittedly, I do not play golf games, so this could be absolute garbage for all I know. But it certainly didn't feel that way. There's something about the game's charming atmosphere and music that make it very relaxing and enjoyable. I even like the voice acting. This is the third shot. It's in the rough, but you need to aim for the green from here. If you were looking for a golf game in the early days of the PS2, this would have been a pretty decent pickup. The last fighting game we'll be looking at is Tekken Tag Tournament. At the time, you would have been much better off picking up this over Street Fighter EX3, but it pales in comparison to DOA2. For one thing, it lacks the expansive fighting arenas. There's no interactivity with the background because it's just that, a background. In fact, it looks almost like you're fighting against a green screen with the awkward boundary that separates the floor and everything beyond. A lot of things that are in DOA 2 are here, but none of it feels as good. In fact, DOA 2 had a tag team mode, and it was pretty fun. Here it's the whole game. The survival mode is less fun as well. Constantly switching to new locations between fights makes it a much slower experience. Also, the way fights work is a bit odd. You don't have to beat both your opponents, just one. There is one saving grace, and it's the awesome soundtrack. There are some very catchy tunes here, and they seem to be at a much higher bitrate compared to any of the other launch games. Maybe it's just me, but they sound really high quality, especially if you're playing with headphones. While it's far from a bad game, it simply was not the best fighter you could have gotten when the PS2 came out. Time Splitters is an incredibly fun, fast-paced first-person shooter from the makers of GoldenEye, and it definitely has that GoldenEye feel. The shooting, aiming, and reloading all feel remarkably similar. And hey, it's not a bad thing to feel similar to a game that's so beloved. The game has a very simple story mode. There are no cutscenes, just a basic goal of picking up an item and delivering it to the exit. Thanks to the game's story, about stopping an evil time-traveling race known as the Time Splitters, each level has a completely different setting with different characters as well. The later games would do a better job in the story department, especially the third, Future Perfect, my personal favorite. And one minor thing that's always bothered me, here's the US box art. <sighs> okay, it's a robot. Here's the PAL region art. What? Why couldn't we get this box? That's so much cooler. Oh well. Time Splitters was one of the best new series to launch with the PS2. 
It's a shame it's now a dead series. If you wanted a multiplayer FPS, but thought Time Splitters wasn't bloody enough, Unreal Tournament had you covered. Except, you could turn off the blood if you really wanted to. Still, this was a decent alternative. The default controls kinda suck, but luckily they can easily be changed to something more modern. The gameplay definitely has that 90s PC FPS feel, complete with exploding enemies. The game is best played with friends though. While Time Splitters had a very basic one player mode, it did still have one and it's fun. The one here is basically the multiplayer mode with bots. You are the, winner. the final racing game from the PS2's launch, and also hands down the worst, Wild Wild Racing is... well, let's take a look. When it starts up, the menus make the game look fairly competent, I guess. There's some track settings and a few cars to pick from. This one looks cool. But then the race starts. So for some reason you turn so incredibly slowly. But then suddenly you'll just spin around and get stuck in a wall. And believe me, it's very easy for this to happen. This game, it's... it's bad. You would have been better off picking from any of the system's other four racers. The last game alphabetically, X Squad is sadly one of the worst. As you can probably tell by the title, it's a squad based game, somewhat in the vein of Rainbow Six or SOCOM, but unlike those series, which have had some pretty decent entries, this game is confusing and bland. You can give orders to your team members, but it's not clear what they'll do, and honestly, in my brief playtime, I never felt like I needed to give them. The game also has stealth. If you count shooting someone in the back with an unsilenced pistol as stealth. Be careful. Enemies respond to any unexpected noises and movements. The box art may have made it look somewhat cool, but trust me, you would have been better off picking up almost any other PS2 launch game. Except maybe Wild Wild Racing. We're done. I hate going out on such a low note as X Squad, so I'll give a few recommends. If I had to narrow it down to 5 PS2 launch games that are still worth playing, I'd go with DOA 2, Fantavision, Ridge Racer 5, SSX, and Time Splitters. Well, with that said, it's time to close this sucker out. Thanks for watching The Legend of Games.